All right, so I think the time says 11 o'clock now. Um, so we're going to begin. Um, today, as you know, we're going to talk a bit about going from a classic waterfall approach to an agile approach to web development. And we're going to focus especially on estimation. Um, my name is Cecil Witka. I'm senior project manager at ADAPT. Uh, and I'm responsible for project management uh, and our overall processes. Yeah, and uh, my name is Mikkel Bo Hansen. I am a strategic client manager at ADAPT. Uh, I started at ADAPT for like four or five months ago and is basically in charge of the implementing these agile processes at ADAPT. So, yeah. Okay, so on the agenda today, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about who ADAPT is. Um, we're going to tell you a bit about why we decided to go agile. Um, then we're going to focus on estimation, and uh, finally we're going to tell you a bit about the results that we've reached so far. Who is ADAPT? ADAPT is a digital agency that unites business, business understanding, sorry, uh, design and technology. Um, we've been in the business for quite some time. Um, we've created some results uh, for leading international brands since 1998. Um, we have experience with launching over 2,000 digital solutions. Um, we have over 80 passionate employees. And uh, as an ADAPT client, you're not just another project, you're actually a part of our team. Um, we're an international company. Um, we have offices in Copenhagen, in Kaunas, Vilnius, and here in Barcelona, and one in Boston. All right, to um, tell you a bit about what we've been through, over the last uh, three years, we've tripled our company size and tripled our average project size. Um, We've gone from only developing on our own Perl platform to developing on a global platform, Drupal. Um, and we've been working with Agile for over a year, but we've intensified the process uh, during the last four to six months. Yeah. Um, when we started out doing uh, Drupal projects, um, we only did smaller projects with well-known functionality, modules that we've used before and knew really well. Um, so, yeah, we thought we knew it all. So we worked with fixed budgets and fixed scope. Um, we had a classic waterfall approach. Um, our projects lasted typically three to six months. And we started out by specifying all of the functionality that we were going to do. Then we designed how it was going to look. We started implementing it, um, then we did our integrations, and then we started testing. And our clients started testing. And our clients and we started uh, creating a lot of new tasks when testing. Um, and since it was quite a long time since the original tasks were specified, um, it was often diff difficult for us to determine whether these new tasks were actually a bug for an original task or if it was a change request. Um, and our waterfall approach didn't really support uh, changes in the estimates unless it was an out-of-scope task, a change request. So we had challenges expanding our budgets for all of these new tasks created in test. And um, we didn't really have any tools for prioritizing our scope since our scope was fixed to a fixed budget um, and we have actually already developed all of the functionality at this point. Um, so we couldn't really leave anything out and prioritizing differently. So our budgets didn't last and we actually ended up losing money on 50% of all our projects, which is not good business. Um, and besides that, our projects grew larger and more complex. We started doing more complex integrations, using a lot of new modules that we hadn't used before, and we needed, we needed lots of uh, custom code to achieve our project goals. Um, 
So we needed to redefine and specify our tasks during our development phase instead of in the beginning, before we started development. Um, and since our project grew, um, we needed to add more resources to the projects as well. Um, one or two developers were no longer enough if we should meet the project deadlines. Um, and since we added more developers to the project, um, they didn't all have the same knowledge or work in the same pace. So to sum up, um, keeping our original estimates uh, was quite difficult when the task kept being redefined. Um, and keeping a fixed budget and a fixed scope is also very difficult when you keep redefining your tasks and expanding them. Um, also, staying within an estimate one developer has given can be difficult for new developers adding added to the project. Um, so we had troubles staying within our estimates. So that's why we decided to go agile. Um, so we started off really slowly by implementing concepts such as sprints and a project backlog, and we started using a tool called Jira, as some of you might know. Um, and we actually saw that these changes that we did improved our work, um, but we didn't really have one person that was responsible for actually facilitating this process. So every time we had questions on how do we do this and why is this going wrong? Um, we didn't really have one person to go to. It was just the person that saw the problem that maybe needed to go try to find a solution. Um, so implementing these tools didn't really fix it all. Um, we saw that we were having trouble with overflowing sprints, meaning then that when we ended a sprint, um, a lot of the tasks weren't finished, so they were needed to move to the next sprint, and this resulting in our project scope growing during the process. Um, and we still faced uh, challenges in keeping our estimates, um, and we actually didn't quite know why we, our estimates weren't uh, keeping, so we lacked an, an overview of what went wrong. So. We uh, decided that um, we needed more focus and dedication if we were going to succeed in going agile. Um, so we went all in. And that's where Miguel came into the picture. Thank you. Um, today I'd like to stand here and talk a bit about, uh, first of all, what is agile? Because you know this is a beginner session, we'd like to get the basics. Uh, into place, and then I like to talk a bit about estimation. Um, but first of all, uh, first of all, um, why agile and what is agile? Um, some of you might be familiar with the agile manifesto. Um, the funny thing about working agile is that when you talk to developers, um, especially developers who have been in the business for many years, they will tell you that's just what we always did. Um, so in, in back in 2001, uh, there was a group who sat down and created what they called the Agile Manifesto. Um, and actually, it's just a basic one-pager about what do we mean by working uh, Agile. And they set up these four basic rules that you should follow. Uh, the first of the rules is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That meaning that to be innovative, it's done by bringing people together and let them talk, let them share ideas. Don't set up a lot of uh, complex processes and tools that kills the innovation. But the funny thing about these rules are that I have seen a lot of times where people say, this means that we shouldn't have any processes or tools at all. Especially developers have this idea that tools and processes are bad. And in some way they're right, but not quite there. Um, so I'll be coming back to this subject later on. The next rule set up by the manifesto is working software over comprehensive uh, documentation. And again here, it's funny how developers kind of read this as we need no documentation. Um, 
Of course, we need documentation. But when we create documentation, we need to keep in mind that we shouldn't do anything that won't give us any value. So we should only do the documentation that we can prove will give us some kind of value. And of course, that's always a good discussion to have with a developer. Um, the third rule is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. What is very important here is that we need to keep our customer, our clients, very close to our process and make them understand why are we doing this as we're doing it. Um, and of course, we need a contract, but basically for the process, the in the perfect world, we should sign the contract and never look at it again because it's about the communication with the customer and, again, also over here. The last rule, which I personally think is one of the most important uh, things about this, is responding to change over following a plan. Um, actually, the keynote this morning was right down my alley on the first couple of slides because he said, yeah, we tried to plan everything, and he had this uh, quote saying, yeah, you have a plan until you get a hit in the face. And that's the same we experienced uh, in our case. Um, so it's very important that we need to be able to respond to these changes that will happen in the context we're working with. We're work all here is working on IT platforms, and we know these platforms are, are moving very rapidly. Um, so therefore, we should be able to adopt all these changes that will come uh, from the world around us. So how do we do that? First of all, we need to, to go away from the old waterfall model. As Cecil just told us, we have this pro problem with the waterfall model that in the end of this process, we get the feedback very late from the customer to find out this is not really what we needed. But basically, we probably have spent most of our budget building what we thought that they need, and then we got a problem. So in the iterative model instead, we go through the same steps basically, um, but we do them all over again all over again and again and again, because when we work on a project, we accumulate knowledge. And it's th it is this knowledge that we need to use when we do this all over again. So instead of doing these steps in like maybe three to six months, we need to do it down in like two to four weeks instead. Because then we get the specification, the design, implementing, integration, test, installation, and then we can actually produce, uh, uh, deliver some software that is working out here. And then we could do this all over again. And then we can put the software into market. And why is that a good idea? It is a good idea because if we do it on, on the old basis, we, start, we know we want to end up out here. And then we start to build this corner and that and work out there. That's not what we want to do. Because there's a good chance that we have a misconsumption out here. So instead of that, we need to build something that will solve the basic needs of our customers. We're working with a concept called the minimal viable product. It is the least product that your customer can put onto market and get working. And why is that a good idea? Because when customers start interact with the software that we produce, then we get the feedback. And very often we'll find out that what we thought that the customer needs is not what the customer needs. And especially what we thought were the most important is not anymore. And you can say, maybe if we go like this and we start making the skateboard and this and the bicycle, we might end up here and find out this actually solved all that we need, all the customer need. We had this idea that the customer needed to be four in the car and they would go, go driving out on a rainy day. And then when we started out, the customers never came back to us and argued that I need to bring more people with me or it's raining all the time. And then there's no reason to build the last step. So this is very important that we ac accumulate this knowledge. Um, basically, we are working with the method uh, at ADAPT called Scrum. I think most of you should be familiar at least with the name of it. Um, I'd like to go through some of the basic terms that I'm going to use a lot today, just to be sure that we're on the same page. So first of all, um, instead of uh, these old school specification, we work with a, a concept called user stories. You might have heard of it before. Uh, it's quite simple. We just define our task on the basic uh, form as a type of user. I want some goal, so that reason. And what we use that for is that we can see what it is that we want to achieve. And this is written on a form that even our customers, non-technical customers, can understand what it is that we're trying to build. Then we take these user stories and put them into a backlog. A backlog is simply a, a prioritized list of tasks that we need to, to get solved. Um, and then we have the sprint. 
the sprint is a time box. We are working with sprint of two weeks, and it's kind of the same going back to the iterative model I just showed you, that we time box and say we commit ourselves to do these user stories within this time box, and that's called a sprint. Then we have two roles that uh, we'll talk about today. One of them is the product owner. The product owner is, yeah, the guy who owns the product. And the product here is the backlog because that contains all the user stories that we want to build. And it's his responsible, uh, responsibility to maintain that the user stories is doable and that they're always prioritized. On the other end, we have the scrum master. The scrum master is typically a... Uh, a guy from the team might be a technical guy, and his responsible is the sprint. So he and the team, working with the, uh, the product owner, finds out what can we uh, say that we will do for the next two weeks. And then we say, okay, we, uh, we say this is our task, we need to do this as a team. So Scrum Master owns the, the sprint, and the product owner owns the backlog. There's, of, of course, a lot more to this, but I could stand and talk about that for several hours, and I don't want to bore you too much. Um, please let me know if there's any questions about this. Um, no, good. Oh, yeah, you mean you don't dare to, to ask. Then, what is it that we try to do in ADAPT? We wanted to have this vision, and we quite fast find out that we, we have this dream, we want to reach the Agile Nirvana and reach the promised 60 to 150% better effectiveness. I think everyone who have had anything to do with Agile methods have heard some of these promised uh, 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 better effectiveness uh, that you always hear on these uh, conferences and stuff like that. And then what happened? Then we got a, the, the same problem I've seen so many, so many times, that we got the management who said, that's what I want. Um, so go fix. That's fine. Um, and then what tends to do? Then, okay, we know we want to work agile. Then we look into the toolbox with the agile tools. Find a tool and then go look for a problem that we can fix with that tool. That's a problem. Um, so what should we do instead of that? Of course, it's good to have the vision. We always need a basic vision. But after that, we have to break it down. Break it down to missions. What can we uh, achieve? How and why are we going to reach our vision? And we did that task in, uh, in ADAPT. And first, we find out that one of our biggest problems, as Cecil just told us, is that we had a lot of projects that's kind of spinning out of control. Um, and of course, this is very uh, expensive, both for us and for the customers. We want to avoid that. It makes good sense. Another thing we want to do is empower the developers. Um, we like to move the power in the organization out in the end of the organization because then we can take faster decisions out there and empower our developers and our employees um, and thereby make faster and better decisions because I very, very often see that people go to management. They've been working like maybe a full week on a problem and then they go to management and ask for a solution for this problem. And of course, it, the best person to know anything about the solution for the problem they have is a guy who has spent a week working on it. And the last thing that we took in here is that we like to increase the quality of our deliveries. Um, because quality in deliveries is the same as customer satisfaction, and that's always good business. And I could stand here and list a lot of stuff uh, today, but today we like to just focus on the first one, about avoiding projects spinning out of control. So the next thing we did is that we need some uh, goals. We need something that we can measure and say, when this is done, we should have finished this mission. So when are we there? The first thing, the first thing that we can take out from what Cecil told us uh, earlier is that we need to have an earlier awareness of problems in the projects, that we can't finish the, pro uh, the project in time, at least not with the scope given right now. The next thing that we like to do is that we like to know why do we spend more time on these tasks, because we spend a lot of time going back and, and trying to find out what went wrong in this project. Then we need to remove overflow from old to new sprints. We started working with sprints, but saw this overflow. So sprint was just a time box that we really didn't use because it was like when two weeks went past, we just looked at, at our board and said, okay, we have a lot of tasks that we didn't finish. We'll just move it to the next sprint. Or even just keep, kept extending uh, the sprint. 
So we'd like to get rid of that. And at last and not least, we like to keep the estimate within a target of plus minus 10%. That would be great. So now we've got the objectives. What is it that we want? Then we can see how will we implement some solutions for this. Um, and of course, we can say that Agile is the headline of the solutions. But here, we, now we have the problems. Now we can go to the toolbox and see what kind of tools do we need to fix these problems. So first, we like to get this better tracking of issue types, because we have this problem that everything was just allocated on these basic uh, tasks. Um, everyone, when everything was like registered on the user stories. So we try, try, try to uh, split out the uh, issue types and user stories, administrative tasks, technical tasks, so we can see where are we spending our time. Next thing is uh, we implement a daily scrum. Daily scrum is just a basic meeting that you have every morning with the team. It shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. This is important. Um, and you just gather the team. Basically, it's good just to stand up and everyone give a report of what did I do yesterday, what do I like to do today, and what kind of problem do I face. Um, and then we take the talk there. And basically, we can keep it within, even with a team like eight uh, members, we can keep that down to like 15, 20 minutes. Um, then we find out that we like to get some clearly defined roles because we didn't really have these roles. And if you don't have roles, but you have a project manager, everything seems to end up with the project manager. And that's not very good, especially because the project manager is not necessarily the guy in the project that knows most about it. So we needed to, to define these uh, uh, um, basic uh, roles that we are working with. Next, we needed to define our processes. And now this is where the dear developers come and say, hey, we don't need processes because you got the manifesto. Yeah, but, but we really didn't have anything. So we needed just to get the basics right. And it might be a good idea to just start implementing the basic um, processes, maybe a, more, a bit more strict than actually you would do when you are working agile. But then later on, you can start removing the processes that you don't like. And then we got the concept of story points, planning program, and tools for forecast. And I'm going a bit fast here because I like to actually go back to those. But when we have the, the strategy of how we want to achieve our goals, our objectives, we need an iterative action plan. And the word iterative is quite important because it's, management tends to go to the teams and say, hey, you need to work uh, to be agile when we work and, and be able to adapt to changes. We need to do that as well in management. That's very important. Make some small changes. See if it's working. If it's not, change it. Listen to your developers when they get back to you and say, this doesn't make any sense for me. You have two options. Remove the problem or tell the developer why this makes sense. That's the only two reasons, uh, ways to do it. So when we got the action plan, we're ready to go. We know who will do what, when. So now I'd like to, uh, to take some time to talk about these three areas, because we have one headline that we can put to that, and that is estimation. And again, the talk this morning was right down my alley about what is the problem about estimation and to plan your work. Because estimation tends to be, when you talk with management about estimation and you give an estimate, it's like that's the truth. There's no way, way that's going to change. But actually, I like to not call it estimation, but call it fortune telling, because then people would be a bit more skeptic, and that's good. So why is this a problem? Um, first, I'd like to talk about the, the relationship between time, risk, and knowledge, because there's a model that I really uh, like, uh, and everyone should know. It's called the cone model. The cone model looks at uncertainty and how that works over time. It's quite basically, because over time we, we get knowledge and therefore our uncertainty um, kind of narrows. And that's good, of course. Um, so in the start of the project, of course, we don't have that much knowledge about the project, what we're doing right now. So we, we're kind of lost, to be honest. Then some times went by, we start working on the task, and then we get a better idea of what is it that we're actually doing. At the end of the project, we know everything about it, and it's way easier for us to, take how long, to tell how long will this be, because we kind of did it. We just need to do the math. 
<laughs> but when you tell this to management that we would really like to do estimation out here, this is kind of the reaction I usually get. Um, because they can't use that for anything because we need a budget up front. But the problem here is that we don't have that much information out here, and we tend, even though we know that, we tend to try to do all the task breakdown, estimation, everything out here, and that's a problem. What we should do instead is that we should accept that we don't have that information. Um, and therefore, know what you don't know is kind of the key here. And people will often go back and say, how can I know something that I don't? That doesn't make any sense. And that's, that's right, of course. But you can know that you don't know it. And when you know that you don't know it, then you can accept that you don't know it. And when you have accepted that you don't know it, you can make it work for you. So this lack of knowledge is not necessarily a problem um, because there's this thing about knowledge that it devaluates over time quite fast. So what we tend to do in, a, in, in the classic waterfall model is that we'll try to do a lot of research up front in the project. And then we start working on it and find out that all the time we spend on this research is not really what we want because we're starting to produce a product that the customer can check and see this is not working for me. So I'd like to talk now a bit about how can you do this wrong, because we had these projects coming in, and all of them had a total budget. I guess you are in the same uh, place as us. And what we do is that we knew that there was something that we didn't know, so we just allocated some time as a buffer, or some money as a buffer. And then we just took our user stories, broke them down to task, and then fill up the scope, what we had for the scope. And then all is fine, and then we start working. What then happens? Then we have a user story that expanded because there's something we didn't know. Okay, that's good. That's what we have the buffer for. So we just kept working. Then we get um, uh, working on user story two and three and started to run in the same problems. And we can see the buffer is now kind of used. We have a little bit left, so we're kind of concerned. But it's okay as long as the rest of the user stories will be in within the estimate, then everything is fine. But what is the chance that it will? But that was kind of the, the way we worked with it. Um, and actually, what we should learn here is that we probably should panic here when we still don't know what will happen here. So how to handle that? We use the concept of story points. Um, let's take this, the scenario again, why this is a problem. We have the management going to a developer saying, how long will it take to do this? Some kind of task that we need to do. And the developer says, oh, I have no idea. My best guess is like 150 to 250 hours uh, from what I know right now. And for some reason, management tend to hear that this is manageable within 150 hours. And see so the developer down here <laughs> laughing. Fantastic. Um, but actually, this is not the biggest problem that we have with this way to do, th do things. The big problem here is that we're actually not doing this right. If we try to be a bit more scientific, I'm not a biologist, I'll say, at first, but if you look at how the brain works, if we take an isolated uh, item and present that to, to a person, and we like that person to describe this object, then we get this problem that the brain actually tries to set up thousands of, uh, of uh, items it can compare it to to try to describe this, and that's very hard uh, on the way we think. So instead of that, we can put in another object to compare this with. Um, and even though, again, I'm not a biologist, I can quite fast say that I'm sure that this organism is way more complex than this organism. And I can tell this is an animal, this is from a plant. And already there, we can actually say a lot about it, not having that much knowledge about the specific of this, but we know what is you can say the difference between these two objects. And that's actually what story points can do for you. It can tell you about what is the difference in complexity compared between two objects, two user stories. Uh, and this is a way easier way for the brain to, to compare uh, objects. And actually, all kind of studies show that this will give more valid estimations. Of course, there's also a downside to this. It can be very hard to make your customers, your clients, to understand the, cost, uh, the concepts of, of story points, and especially this, that a story point is not a static thing. A story point is only telling us about this object compared to this object, what is the relationship. And we can do that within a project, maybe within a team, 
But the most common mistake people do here is starting to, to compare story points across teams, across projects, because it might not be the same value that we are working with. So, a small uh, exercise here I'd like to do. I'd like to ask you first, how many of you have played with Lego when you were a kid? Fantastic. So now we've collected a, a bunch of experts in Lego. So the next thing should be quite easy. I'd just like to ask you, this model I have here, how long will it take to assemble it? I know you don't have the manual. Any guesses? Ten hours. That would fast. I need you next time I build a Lego figure. Not that many you like to give. <laughs> They're good. 200 to 400. That one guess. And I'm getting a bit concerned here because you are hopefully all in the IT business and no one asks, what should this one do? What can it do? Maybe we don't know. But if now I say, okay, I don't like to know how many hours it will take, but I put this model in instead, and now I ask another question. I'd like to ask you which one of these will take the longest, the one to the left or the one to the right? Anyone who wants to come with a guess on that? Who said right? <laughs> Hopefully it will be the one here to the left. Um, that we can quite fast see that this is quite complex. And my next question is, if you can only say on a scale, is this twice the time, four times, eight times, 16, or 32 times, then you actually might have an idea on where on the scale we are, and that's all we want to know. Because we don't have more information right now, but now we have some idea on uh, how these two, how complex they are compared to each other. And how do we do this in practice in everyday basics? We start using uh, the concept, uh, concept of planning poker, which is a great guessing game. Planning poker is quite simple. We uh, get the team together. They got, everyone get a deck of cards like this. And you can see it's, it's uh, raising quite rapidly. And that's good. Um, then you get the team into a room, either with the scrum master or the product owner. And they take one user story and describe the user story quite fast. And the team are not allowed, they're allowed to ask simple, basic questions, but they're not allowed to start discussing how do we solve this user story. Instead of that, they take that deck of cards and pick one card. And we wait for everyone to sit with their card, and then they can show the card to us. And thereby, we can see how complex did they think that this user story are. And sometimes there would be quite a big difference between how complex your developers think that this user story are. So instead of starting a discussion now, now we just take the guy with the highest card and ask him, why do you think this uh, task is that complex? And he got the chance to say, oh, we need to, to make a lot of customization, create our own modules from scratch and stuff like that. And then we go to the guy with the, the, with the smallest value and say, he can then say, tell us, yeah, but there's some good, uh, some good modules out there and that might actually solve like 95% of all um, we need to do. And then, this, the, the, then they can have a short discussion about this. And probably a guy with an eight sitting in the middle say, hey, yeah, you might be right. I've been working with that module, and I'm quite sure we can make this modification to the module, and then we'll be reaching like the 100%. Okay, wonderful. Then everyone picks up a new card, do the same as we did just moments ago, and we should be at least nearly on the same page. Of course, there can be uh, a situation where we're not. But here, we can say, okay, that's an eight. And always be a bit more pessimistic if you're in doubt. If you have a big span still in, in numbers here, there might be a good reason for that. It might be because we don't have the knowledge that we need um, to do this. And there can be two reasons for that. One thing can, do, can be that the user story that we got is not good enough. Then the, you, the product owner will have to go back and re revisit this uh, user story. And that's okay. <coughs> The developers should never allow a bad user story to get through here. It's their responsibility to make sure that they understand this and they can uh, vouch for, for this estimate. The other thing can be that actually, even though this is very highly skilled developers, there is some technical questions that they can't answer because they have not worked with this before. And then we can make a time box for them. You usually call this a spike. 
It's like you're setting off, like, let's say, three hours and, and say, it's okay, we can allocate three hours for someone to go um, researching on this, and then we should be able to do it. And then take the user story up next time you do this planning poker session. And the guy who spent the three hours can then tell the rest of the team, this is what I think. And this is also a great, one thing, yeah, of course, it's great estimates. But another good thing about the planning poker session is that you also get this as a forum to share knowledge between your developers. So don't think that you can do this just one or two guys. Do it with the team. So i like to talk a bit about just-in-time management after this because now we know how we find out our user stories. Now we need to find out how do we make these work for us in everyday basic. And I need to say that this example is extremely simplified because basically when we work on projects in ADAPT, we take in like 50 to 100 user stories for a project. But if I put 100 user stories up here, I think I'll lose you on the way. Um, even with the small amount of user stories, I might. And please don't feel free to, to ask questions uh, uh, on the way. But basically, what we have is we have this backlog of user stories. And we know how many story points we have for each user story. So we know the complexity compared between the user stories, but we don't know how far can we get. We can't take the, the story points right now and turn it into hours. So what we like to do is that we take the first user stories, take some of the highly prioritized user stories and the user stories that you feel most comfortable about. Take something that you have done before, something that looks like at least something you have done before. And then we break them down to, to subtasks and put an estimate on them in hours. And then we can do some basic math. We can take the total hours. Here in this example, we have like 89 hours. Then we can take the total of our story points and do some simple math and say how many hours do we spend per story point. This is also called our velocity. This tells us how fast are we moving forward. How many, for every time we spend 100 hours, how many user stories uh, can we expect to do? So basically, we get this, uh, again, a simplified, we don't do that many projects in this size, but just for the example, and a manager come in and say, okay, I have only 160 hours to spend. That's all right. Now we have to find out how far can we get for 160 hours. We have the velocity, so now we can just do this simple math and find out that 160 hours with the current velocity is like 70 story points. Wait, now we can see how far we'll get. We'll actually get to solve up to user story 9, and after that we can't do it within this scope. So there's only two ways to fix this if the customer comes to tell us we really need this. Okay, there's two things we can do. We can use, we can remove a user story here, or we can expand the budget. That's what we can do. So, then we start working on the project. And what then happens? Then again, we run into the same problems as we did before. We still have some tasks that we couldn't foresee that this would be more complex. Of course, we should also run into tasks that is less complex than we expected. But just for the example here, we, we take the more pessimistic uh, view of it. So let's say that some, some uh, task uh, user stories is, is getting more complex than we have hoped. Then what to do? This is very important. Keep your story points static. Don't change the story points. The only time you want to change the story point is if, if you change the user story uh, a lot, because this still represents what we thought was the uh, complexity of this user story compared to the other user stories. So what we really want to do is that we need to skip this one and do it all over again. So now we actually worked on it, so now we have some more knowledge and we can take that knowledge into the game. So we can again say, okay, we have 63 hours, we only ended like 18 story points, now our velocity is 3.50. And therefore, we have now a problem that we won't get as much done as we hope to. But it's better to know it now than to know it when we have done the whole backlog. So now we just expand the rest of the user stories with this factor. And we can see, okay, this is going to be a problem. Now we can only do the first six user stories. But we can take this discussion with the client and customer up front and find out a solution for this because we are, we are working out from a, from a 
uh, time and material basics. So they just pay per hour. So we need to guide the customer here and help them and, and show them how much we'll do. And we can always tell them, now we can, this is how it looks like right now. Then we start working on some more user stories. We can't be lucky that some of them are less complex than we thought, and then we do this again. But we need always to keep tracking this. And now, back to the headline, just-in-time management is so important here. And why that? Just-in-time management means that we should only look at what we need to work with right now. Because in the other model you saw, we, we tend to do that. We put all, look at all our user stories, and then we broke all the user do stories down to subtasks at the time where we have the least knowledge about this project. And that's a problem, because every time we find out that something changes, there might be some uh, external APIs that didn't uh, do as we expected or anything like that that we can expect to hit the rest of our user stories. If we already broke all these user stories down to subtasks, then we have a lot of user stories that we have to revisit. In this model, we only have to revisit what we already work with, what we already broke down. So no, we, we don't have to do, spend that much time revisiting uh, stuff. Does this make any sense to you? Fantastic. Some is nodding and someone's just falling asleep. Um, this is the basic model that we work from now. And now, Cecil, get this again. Yep. All right, to tell you a bit about the results that we've uh, reached so far. Well, um, we see that uh, it works, um, but it's work in progress. As I told you in the beginning, we uh, haven't been doing this uh, dedicated for such a long time yet, so we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but we can see that uh, one of our main challenges, uh, keeping our fixed budget, uh, we kind of solved. When we continuously uh, revisit our velocity uh, to redefine and prioritize the scope, then we can keep the fixed budget. That's a good thing. Also, one of our big challenges was the estimation, and that has improved a lot in accuracy. Um, when we're estimating our tasks uh, at Sprint Startup, we bring in our learnings from earlier in the project, um, which, again, makes the estimates far more accurate. Also, when we're doing the planning poker as a team, instead of just one person estimating, um, then we both support knowledge sharing, um, but also we get the team to commit to the story points. Um, again, that's a good thing. That results in more precise estimates. But there's always a but. Um, implementing agile methods is, is hard work, and it depends uh, dedication and investment. Um, also, we experience that it's often uh, difficult to explain to the customer how prioritizing functionality can be a good thing. Um, they really just want it all, all of the time. Um, and sometimes uh, when telling them that we want to build what gives the most value to you, to your end customer, um, it's kind of hard to accept that you're not getting all of what you thought you were going to get. Um, we also experience that some of our customers simply aren't ready for Agile. Um, they think it's too risky not knowing um, the end product when they're signing the contract, um, not knowing exactly what you're going to get. Um, and also on our small projects uh, that might only be like two or three sprints, um, the whole scrum thing can be difficult to implement or at least using your velocity because you don't get to know so much about the project when you're only doing two or three sprints. Yes. One slide to rule them all. But what I have seen is the most important when you start uh, adapting these ad, uh, agile methods is no two organizations are the same. You need to customize these methods to the context that you are working in. I've seen so many companies reading a lot of books, sending all their employees to be uh, certified scrum masters and stuff like that. And they don't have anyone to kind of take the responsibility for this to happen on an everyday basis. So it's so important that if you want to go back and implement some of these methods, always keep in mind what is my context of this, what can I use. And again, go for the iterative action plan. Try to implement some of it, see how it works, 
Adjust it. Adjust it, adjust it, adjust it all the time. You're never done doing this. Not even Google are done doing this. They also adjust these methods along the way. So, I think we're quite there. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, first of all, any questions about these slides? I think you need to go to the mic, actually, because yeah. it's being recorded. Hi, can you hear me better? Uh, yeah. Uh, so a simple question. You're talking about different user stories. And in my experience, they're quite interdependent. So if you um, deliver this user story one, you've already built some of the functionality for user story two. And how do you, how do you estimate based on that interdependence? Um, that's a very good question. And it, it, it's a question I hear a lot. Um, to make this short, uh, first of all, it's, it's first of all, it's good practice to break down your user stories in in smallest bits. And of course, there will be some tasks that you kind of can say this is associated with all my user stories. What we did is that there would be some technical tasks first of all that you can say setting up test platforms and stuff like that is just we need that done. We made that as as a specific issue type, um, so we just took it away from the user stories. Then you can say if you can also have some like a module that would, would fix multiple user stories. Then go for the user stories, user story with the highest value, the highest business value, and allocate the time, the basic time for implementing the module on that, and just remember it, because then when you look at your backlog again and and compare your business value with the estimation and think, oh, this is going to take so long time, I'd, I'd rather have these four. But then you have the relationship between them and, and, and screw up things. Um, but it's very important to keep it down to multiple uh, user stories um, because when you do that, even though you're implementing a, uh, a module that can fix like more, multiple user stories, then you can still allocate and saying that it's, very, it's not very often that you see one module fixing everything for all user stories. It might fix like 90% of the user stories that it associated with, but you still need this last 10%. And you still need to keep the user stories for that and say, okay, for the first user story, I'll implement the module and I fix it so it will solve this user story. And I know I have some other user stories. They might not be that highly prioritized. And you can end up with a project, uh, all our projects is, is, is uh, have this fixed budget and in the end of the day, we'll find out that there might be some other small tasks that we actually rather have than fixing this module, doing the rest of the user stories. So keep the user stories, because then you can, you can still prioritize, even though it's a small fix to a module that will fix this user story, there might be another small fix that is more valuable to you. Does that make sense? Good. There was other questions? No one wants to go to the mic. Yeah, the guy in the blue shirt there. So how would you sell customer this idea that uh, if they pay X amount of money, they may get three stories or five or ten or one? Uh, it's, it's, I know it's hard, but do you have any pointers? How would you Yes. Um, basically, um, the way to sell this to the customer is to explain this process. Explain to them why is the agile methods better than the old waterfall model, and the way I usually explain this to customers is that there are some uh, uh, some surveys made that show that when you do the waterfall process, you tend to build way more than you actually need, and when you have this time and material contract with the client, they are the guys who are paying for this, and and one survey showed that it's like sixty percent of all you built that will end up in a category called never used or rarely used. Uh, and we don't want to build that for the customer, and the customer don't need that. So it's, it's a hard job, basically, no doubt about that. But what we're doing in Adapt is that we keep uh, these processes very close to the sales team and, and make sure that our sales team understand why do we do this and what is the value in this for the customer. Uh, but it is a hard job. But take your time to present these methods to the customer and make them understand why it is a good idea. Yeah, there's one guy standing at the mic. <laughs> Hi, the, uh, the poker game seems really intriguing, and I'm wondering how you transitioned to getting a lot of developers and strategic minds 
in the sales process to the estimation process because it seems like a lot of people's time for something that you may or may not sell at the end of the day. So it seems like like you're playing poker, you're kind of gambling with people's billable time. Yeah, I'm curious how that's a very good, uh, very good uh, point. Um, what we can do about that is that in the start of a project, uh, instead of working with these highly specified uh, user stories in the beginning, because we can't spend a lot of time working on a contract that we'll never finish, then rather work with uh, with epics, which is like a, uh, uh, what you can say, a very large user story that would just explain big chunks of the functionality in the end uh, system, and then do the planning poker for that with a couple of lead developers and maybe uh, the, the client manager. Um, and then take it from there, but again, make the client understand that this is not a contract with a, with a fixed scope. We don't want to do that kind of, kind of contracts. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically what, what I recommend doing. And then, of course, uh, at Adapt, we're focusing on making this uh, analysis phase for the customer, because it's very often that a customer comes to us with an idea of what they want, and when we put it through our UX department, we'll find out that's not what your customers need. Okay. Yeah, next. Hi. So when you are in the sales phase with a customer and um, you are able to sell this kind of agile process to him, but he still says that I need some kind of budget. I, s I still need some kind of ballpark figure, uh, figure how much does this uh, project cost? cost? How yeah. do you approach that and what do you... First of all, I like to turn it upside down and remind the customer this is not about... Uh, how much will it cost? Because it's not an, an interesting discussion to have the, with the customer. It's about what kind of project, uh, product can we create within the budget that you have. And then we can say, we expect that we can do this. That's our best guess right now. And then we start working on the project, making these analysis and stuff like that. And what we actually like to do is that we like to just sell this analysis for the customer and, and spend like maybe two, three hundred hours just finding out what is the right solution for you. And we've done that, then we have a lot of user stories. And actually the customer is able to go to another uh, IT house to get this built if they find out this is not, we, we're working on Drupal, but they might find out that this is not the right platform for the product they now know that they should build. And, and that way we would like to do that first, sell that separately, and then find out should we build it on Drupal. Uh, very often, you can say from, from our point of perspective, this can be a bit risky, of course, but now we have accumulated all this knowledge about the, the project, so it's not that easy to go to another uh, development house anyway. <laughs> Did that answer the question? Okay, next. Uh, my question is around uh, how you organize yourself uh, over, like, with scrum of scrums over your whole um, organization. How do you manage several projects with Scrum at the same time. I don't know if you have maintenance projects, if you have ongoing client relationships, how do you deal with these things? Yeah, um, <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> um, maybe you want to, yeah. to answer that question. Well, we have an organization that's uh, client team based, uh, meaning that we have actually four client teams uh, with a group of developers, a UXer, a uh, project manager, maybe also a project coordinator. Um, so we have our clients attached to one team and they stay in this team uh, even for maintenance, for maintenance uh, afterwards. Um, and within the client team, we also have a scrum master and a product owner. Um, okay. But do you have then uh, per team several clients? Because after yeah. some time you will have then a bunch of clients. Yes, we okay. have very different sized clients actually. So mm -hmm. we have uh, one team that is almost only working on one client and then we have other teams working on several clients. Um, and yeah, it is a challenge doing lots of clients in the same team, but um, we, uh, we make it work. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, uh, my question is about user, user stories uh, and tasks. So when do user stories turn into tasks and how do you estimate the points without knowing all of the tasks first? Do developers estimate the task or how do you break it down to tasks? Um, what we do, um, first of all, we, we uh, yeah, it's the developers who will break this down to tasks. That is very important because it is the developer who is gonna solve these tasks and they need to have this ownership of that. Um, 
the way we, we we do the breakdown is that that's another reason to do the 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 planning poker session with the whole team because then you have this knowledge sharing about uh, the whole project and thereby you can assign maybe two developers working together on some part of the project break that down to ta- sub task and some other can do it uh, another way but basically this is why it's so important that your backlog is always prioritized because you start breaking down the user stories from the top of the backlog first Again, this just-in-time management is so important because else we spend way too much time just trying to, to break down tasks that when we finish the sprint, we'll find out, okay, we're never going to use this anyway, and then it's just wasted time. Did it answer the question? Yeah. Perfect. Hi. Um, when you're planning sprints, how do you mitigate for risk? So, for example, you've broken down your user stories, you've got them all prioritized, and you now have a list of tasks and some of them are longer than others, uh, some of them more complex than others. Do you approach it with most complex tasks first? Do you give the client a quick bang for their buck and do some simple tasks first? How do you balance that? Um, it's, it's a hard job. Basically, uh, again, going back to the backlog, we need to sort, sort the backlog from what gave us the most value. And that should be the main key for what you build first. Of course, there can be, if, if you can say, the budget is so big that we know there's a bunch of stuff that we will build. We can't launch without these. Um, then, of course, it's a good idea to build the most complex user stories first. But as soon as you say the word complex user story, you should revisit that user story and see if you could break it down to several less complex user stories. That's quite important. Uh, because then you can prior, prioritize them again. And it's very rarely that you have a, a complex task that can't be broken down to several user stories. Okay. A lot of persons try to, to tell you that it can't be done, but it can. Okay, thank you. Hi, I have two questions. The first is about requirements. Who actually writes the requirements, and are those in your user stories? Are they deep and detailed, or the developer kind of you know works off of that? Yeah, um, that's another thing I could talk about for hours. Okay, <laughs> sure. um, basically, we, we use these user stories. In a user story, we have this uh, uh, model saying that as a user, I like to be able to do something for some reason. And then the product owner is the owner of the user story from here. Um, but the product owner, uh, we see that as a, a role that can be shared by multiple people. And especially the client. We need, we need to have our client very close to us. And they t- have to take part in this role as the product owner. Um, so, so they will be a part of uh, creating these user stories. Of course, um, we will have one person very often in our organization, the product manager, who is, is like uh, in charge of making sure this is done and the quality of the user stories is all right. But we do it with the customer. And very often with our UX team, we'll do it in, in the analysis phase that we do up front in the project. Okay. Another thing, it might be out of scope of here, but testing. How do you integrate the testing or estimates for testing? Um, That's the reason that we introduced these new processes, because that was a big problem for us. The quality for the first review from the customers was too bad, to be honest. That we have these basic errors that that the client should never see, because they... They, they just lose their, uh, their comfort in the project, and they don't uh, believe that we are the right house to do if we keep showing them bad stuff. Um, so we changed the way that a, pro- uh, a user story lives through the project um, and make it uh, uh, necessary for the user story to go through uh, QA, for example, both by the developer who did it. We have the review. We have... Uh, develop a test on the test platform, then it goes to QA, then the customer sees it, and, and first when the customer accepts it, it's done for the sprint. And that should all happen within the sprint. And then, again, very important that you keep your user stories very small. Right. And so do you try to uh, resolve bugs within that sprint, or do they overflow? Yeah, always resolve the bugs within the sprint. That's very important. Because one of the problems that we had before was that when we started working on, on our bug, then we couldn't remember what user story was this related to. And then it's hard for us to say, is this actually a bug or is this a change in the scope? And, and for the user stories, we, we have these acceptance criteria that we put in, which, which is like things that we can say, check, this is actually done by, by the system now. 
Um, and it's way easier if you get the bug, we can see is this related to an acceptance criteria, criteria within the user story. Great, thank you. You're so welcome. I think we can take the last question, then we're running out of time. Very good. <clears throat> we, uh, we practice Agile. We do everything that you're talking about, and we still struggle with definition of done. So <laughs> I'm, I'm but, That's but, a classic. <laughs> is, is that the session over now? Like, you've got to go. Ah, no, yeah, I'm not in a hurry, so don't no, worry. The, um, like the waterfall process almost gives you a, an exact pass or fail. At the end, you either did what you said you were going to do or you didn't. And Agile gives you, we did 80% of what we set out to do and some extra stuff or 90% and so on. Uh, what the client wants and if you manage clients, like the satisfaction for the client is all about a bit of a wow factor. They feel good about everything they got delivered. So what's your definition? Um, first of all, I, I need to give you a short answer here because we're running out of time. Um, to, to keep it short, um, we have made our own de definition of done, and I, um, I haven't bring, brought it here, and, and I'm quite sure it's not making any sense to bring it here because, again, no two organizations are the same. But the first thing I would say is that it's good to have this definition of done. Create it. Do it in collaboration with your organization and, and make this definition of done and only have one. That's actually the most important because I heard the term done done so many times and I like to break the arms of the ter every time of the guy that, that tells me that. There's only one done and it needs to be done within the sprint. The only thing that we can, not, we can put outside is the sprint is that we merge it to the production. That should be all that is left on a user story when it's done for the sprint. Uh, do what? Oh, that's for the project. Actually, for the whole process, for the way we work. We have the same definition of done for all our projects. But yeah, it's a good point. You might want to do it per project. Good. I think we're done. Yep. Um, just to... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Before we leave, if you uh, have any further questions or comments, we have a uh, booth downstairs. Uh, it's called Adapt. And uh, me and Miguel will be standing there uh, during lunch and until 2 o'clock. So please stop by. Thank I'd you. I'd like to show you some more slides about this definition of a <laughs> if you like. <laughs> I have a full slideshow of it. <laughs>